I want to be addressing the topic of our last session, which we're, we've got the question of some model case examples. And I want to do that by um, talking about a way that a group of us have gotten together to try to understand ways of learning that seem to be pretty commonplace across indigenous and indigenous heritage communities of the Americas. And so I'll have two parts to my, uh, my comments. One part about how we can collaborate better than we often do across disciplines, across generations, across nations, across cultural backgrounds, to understand a phenomenon that looks to be of interest. And the other part is, so what, did we, what are we learning by doing that? And it's actually both sides of the, those pieces are about collaboration itself. So we're learning about collaboration itself in our efforts to collaborate and in the research about collaboration that has uh, stemmed from our, under our understanding of common ways of learning in um, indigenous America. So many times, I have some preliminary comments about how we go about cultural research. Um, models of cultural research often are um, simplified when we try to just simply get beyond the idea that, that human functioning is generic, that we don't really have to consider culture. So the, the conversation becomes culture matters. Culture simply matters. And in that conversation, we just try to find differences across groups. Um, often it's dichotomized, the East versus the West, or us versus them, or us versus the rest. Um, and, uh, and often whole continents are regarded as cultures, treated as, as cultures. Um, and many times, the, the conceptual model that's used is one of culture influences individuals, which I have referred to as a cultural influence model. Um, an alternative, well, a way of thinking about a whole argument about us understand, understanding cultural aspects of uh, human functioning is that that's taking the discussion from point A to point B. Um, and I used to do a lot of point A to point B, but then I got frustrated because it seemed like I was stuck in conversations that were only talking about point A to B, and I wanted to get at least to from F to G, and maybe we could even get further down the alphabet than that. So in that process, um, I think we shift to how does culture matter? What do we learn about patterns of human functioning by paying attention to different arrangements of life in different socio-historical cultural circumstances? Um, this leads us into a more ecological approach, at least from my reading of the literature and the, and the work that I've been trying to do. It involves looking at constellations of practices of participants in communities. And the focus has to stay close to everyday life, people's lived experience. Um, and from this perspective, we look at culture as ways of life in generations participating in communities, which is, I hope you see the contrast with what I presented in, in the argument that simply tries to say culture matters and uses a cultural influence approach. Um, I refer to this as a mutually constituting approach, and I wrote about that in the book that's referenced there. Um, as we try to move beyond the generic approach, there's also questions of how do we uh, organize our research um, towards uh, more cultural fidelity than what we have been doing in just regarding uh, populations as being generic. Um, and there's lots of calls to try to diversify research. I'm a, a developmental psychologist, but I have training in some other fields as well. Um, but in developmental psychology, how let's diversify our understanding of child development because we're trying to talk about human children. We're not just trying to talk about a small sample. Um, many times, that has led to diversifying samples. In fact, I think it was about 20 years ago that National Institute of Health mandated 
inclusion of women and minorities in greater proportions in NIH research unless you justify why you wouldn't. But that was not accompanied by um, paying attention to how, how the measures that we use or the procedures that we use, the way we observe people, that it needs to be adapted to be fitting for the populations that we're studying. So rather than the suitcase psychologist, which we saw earlier in somebody's slide, um, who drops into the field with many years ago, it was Piagetian tests. This has been around for a long time. Piagetian tests, you drop in, you do your tests, and you leave. Um, we have to adapt procedures to, with extensive piloting in order to ensure that the procedures mean the same thing to the researchers and the participants. We also need the interpretation of whatever we find to be um, informed by knowledge of the local scene. And that means trying to get beyond the blinders of our ethnocentric own personal experience. So we need extensive background information, knowledge of the lived experience of the people that we are uh, trying to characterize. This involves ethnographic research, involvement in the local community, and collaboration with the research participants and other people in the communities that we're trying to make statements about. OK, so I'm wanting to make the argument that we need collaboration across researchers, and I'm including in researchers the participants in the research who are helping us understand what our procedures mean locally and helping us adapt. Um, but it can be challenging to be collaborating across different groups. I'm going to give you a few very quick uh, reasons for that. Um, there's disciplinary differences, national differences, ethnic and racial, and especially status and power differences that get in the way of good communication, good collaboration. Um, among them, differences in or historical relations that make it challenging for um, people to communicate straightforwardly with, with confidence that everybody can speak equally. Um, things like colonization, warfare, enslavement, schooling I'm including because it has been used as a colonial tool uh, to subjugate populations. There's all these things that might get in the way of somebody from a dominant group and somebody from a subjugated group being able to share information in the way that we need information to be shared in order to make progress in cultural understanding. Um, I'm going to just skip that. You can imagine other parts so that I can get to um, a, a potential model for um, how we've gone about trying to get beyond that. Um, I, I've been involved in um, leading a consortium that is focused on um, learning a way of learning that's commonplace in indigenous Americas. Um, which we call learning by observing and pitching in to family and community endeavors, which for shorthand we call LOPI. Um, the consortium involves over, the, over 13 years. It involves about 50 people, a little bit more probably, and a core group of about 25 researchers. Um, there's where people distributed across uh, U, three U.S. countries, uh, I'm sorry, three U.S. meetings we had, uh, three Mexi meetings in Mexico, one in Guatemala, and last week we met in Canada, and that's the Canadian meeting on your right, and this was one in uh, Mexico some years back. And the participants get together, um, oh, before I mention that, we've managed um, to do this with not a huge sum of money. It is money, but it's not like millions. It's about uh, $310,000 for eight meetings and, and a bunch of small writing grants that were funded by NSF. And those writing grants yielded 30 articles and, an, uh, and a um, special issue of human development. Um, We've also um, created a website, and that's the in blue, the website that um, sort of draws together research on LOPI, um, and published about 20 other articles and, uh, and a volume in the Advances series, which um, you can see a picture from there. Um, and so 
we have very lively conversations and by all measures, I think it's been very successful and, and continues in between the meetings as well. I wanna talk about what are some of the features that we think have made this consortium a model. I mean, lots of people get together in meetings, they're not always models. What I think, uh, one of the features that I think makes this a model is that we don't just focus on a population. We're focusing on a phenomenon as well as a population. Um, the phenomenon in this case is LOPI, um, and it involves a way of learning which we think is especially common in uh, the population that we're focusing on. So rather than just getting together and talking about every aspect of some population, we've got, we've got a, a, a goal that has to do with understanding a phenomenon. Um, it gives us a shared, shared purpose, um, and it also gives us a focus on strengths. So um, both of those, I think, are very important for the participants feeling a sense that the goal is, uh, is trying to accomplish something bigger than themselves, um, a collaborative um, ethos. Um, we're not just trying to make a career for ourselves, we're trying to solve this problem, or uh, not a problem, but solve this puzzle of how to understand this and characterize this way of learning that seems prevalent in, um, um, uh, in the Americas, in indigenous communities of the Americas. And we think that understanding it can make a difference, especially for trying to get beyond, trying to get beyond some of the ways that learning is organized in, um, in an assembly line fashion, which I think probably everybody's familiar with from your own, usually from your own classroom experience whether you teach that way or whether you just had classes that way. So a little bit about learning by observing and pitching in. Um, the images give you some idea of it here. Um, it, my initial interest in it and um, beginning awareness of LOPI was from my research in a Mayan community in Guatemala beginning 30, 40 some years ago. Um, and um, I asked mothers in the community how they taught their children to do the fancy things that I observed their children doing, including weaving. And the mothers said, well, we don't teach them. They just learn, which for me was a puzzle because I thought, based maybe on my 20 years of schooling thus far, that you have to be taught in order to learn. So I began to pay attention to the children's learning and now, 40 some years later, um, we're calling it learning by observing and pitching in to family and community endeavors. And our effort has been, and I don't expect you to read that, it's just standing in for something. Um, our effort has been to try to articulate what are the features of this way of organizing learning? How, are, how is this way defined? How could we, how could we see it not in a coding way, but how do, we, how do we know this paradigm? And it has seven features, which are the seven facets of that, of that prism. And I'm not gonna march you through that, but I'm gonna use it here and there in my, um, in my remarks. Um, I'll give you a little bit more of an example of what LOPI uh, involves. Um, it, it, one of the key features, the central one, number one, facet number one, involves the um, children, like adults, being contributing members, contributing participants in the almost or all of the activities of the community. So that rather than having an adult child, adult world separate from a child world, which is so often the case in middle class societies, children and adults are together as contributors to the community. So, um, that's actually the central feature of, of, uh, of Lopi in the prism. Um, some examples in the images, the little girls helping on the upper left, helping to get corn off the cob with their mother and their grandmother. Um, on the bottom left, some of you will be interested to see this video from, uh, it's a silent clip from 1941 from Ben Paul and Lois Paul who videotaped the girls are involved in bringing water from the lake up to the town for the family's cooking. 
even the little smallest ones who are not playing, they are actually helping carry, carry water up. Many of you have observed this kind of thing in communities in which you've worked. It may be like Lopi or it might not. And so one of our questions that we've been researching is to what extent are all seven features of the prism, um, can, how much can we observe those in different um, indigenous populations of the Americas? And so we've been doing research up um, mainly in Mexico, uh, Guatemala, and California. Um, but collaborators in our team are saying from the most southern part of Chile up through parts of Canada, yes, it seems to fit, it seems to fit. So what seems to fit is the characterization that we're trying to develop of what is involved in LOPI. The, uh, this is, it's a way of learning that is sort of uh, maybe common sense or maybe so practiced that people don't necessarily have ways to talk about it. In indigenous communities of the Americas, people often don't reflect on, we all don't often reflect on our own ways of doing things. but. It's met with with uh, signs of recognition when when we talk about it, and many of the participants in the um, consortium are people from who have grown up themselves in indigenous communities of the Americas. So it's especially fruitful to be hearing. Okay, the description in facet number. Right now, we we've had some discussion of facet number three. How the description there? I think there's a better way to think about that, and so we have. We, we have a collaboration going across these nations, disciplines, and uh, own individual backgrounds that helps us try to articulate, the, articulate this way of, of organizing things. Um, a second feature of the consortium, which I think is helpful for our being able to collaborate together on that, is an attitude of respect and interest in learning from each other, like I just described. So um, last week, we had a group of about 20 sitting around for, this was just in a, a casual casual get-together, get about 20 of us sitting around and trying to figure out, we know that the word obedience has something to do with what's going on, but it's not a good word for it. It does not mean the same thing in Spanish or English as it does in the indigenous communities themselves. So what's a better way to say it? And we had six different indigenous languages represented among us. Um, all I speak Sutuhil to some extent, but I don't know enough of that. But the other five <laughs> languages that were represented were by native speakers of those languages. And we tried going from the native languages to Spanish and English to see if we could find a better way to say this aspect, which has to do with listening. Not so much obedience like a boss to a um, underling, but listening. Does this child listen? And if they listen, it means, OK, they're on board. They know how to be a part of things. And then we have discussions about, well, maybe it's how, 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 to, how to imagine it. Um, so, we, so the group involves a whole lot of diversity in in disciplines, in the um, methods that we use. It's a broad portfolio, which I think is essential to our being able to make progress in understanding culture, not just qualitative um, or quantitative, but qualitative and quantitative and whatever mixes we can come up with in some other methods as well. We need all of the broad portfolio. We're not getting that in our journals. The journals have narrowed over the time that I've been in the field to being more quantitative and eliminating some of the qualitative work that's really essential to our being able to make progress. Um, we are diverse in terms of uh, generation, nationality, ethnicity, and um, the lived experience of all the, of the participants. And that gives us a start of uh, having a shared phenomenon and this kind of respectful, interested conversation gives us a chance to use our shared experience regarding a phenomenon that we all have some understanding of from our own experience with it and trying to figure out how to make progress in um, articulating it in a scientific manner. Um, so what I've been talking about in this kind of collaboration 
has to do with facet three of the prism, which I'll read it for you because it may be hard to read there. Um, interaction is collaborative. Well, it's about the social organization of social interaction. Facet number one is community organization. How is the community organized collaboratively? Facet number three is how does social interaction organized collaboratively, which means um, people coordinate fluidly as a flexible ensemble. They blend diverse ideas, agendas, and pace. Everybody contributes and is engaged with initiative and with a unified intention. So that's characteristic of the consortium, but it's also characteristic of what we're seeing about uh, children's and other people's learning in uh, indigenous communities of the Americas. And I'd like to show you an example of it. Um, these are girls who are um, working together as an ensemble. They're coordinating their ideas. They're trying to make a uh, Model B from uh, one that's already constructed. And I think you'll be able to see how they coordinate in, a, in that kind of fluid, flexible way from this video clip. Uh, there we go. Um, sound. Is there a sound thing? There it is, I think. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Um, if the sound doesn't go, it's not a catastrophe. Um, I hope you can see how they're moving in tandem. They are paying attention to what each other's doing. Nobody is blocking anybody else. They're actually facilitating what each other's doing. They're not all doing the same thing at the same time, but, they're, but their efforts are coordinated. Um, my my uh, grad student, Andy Dayton, says it's like one organism with six limbs. And my daughter who watched this said it's like they have a unified intention. And um, are you able to see it? Okay, so um, we've done a number of studies, and I'm just going to give you an example of one of them in which we compared the kind of collaboration that we saw of in Mexican heritage kids in California with uh, European American kids in California, middle class European American kids in California. In this case, they're, they're given a task of developing an efficient route through a model grocery store. And you can see from the graph that the Mexican heritage kids are collaborating twice as much as the European heritage kids. So what are the Euro middle class European heritage kids doing? They're dividing things up. Um, they did it in several ways. One is by taking turns. So I'll do it, then you do it, and then I'll do it, and then you'll do it. They're not thinking together. It's a way of dividing things. Another way they commonly did it was uh, like the kid that you see on the right who's pushing his sister out of the way so he can do it by himself. That's also not shared thinking. And a third way that was common was for one kid to take on the role of boss and the other kid to simply carry out orders. So all three of those were common among the European heritage kids. And one of the things I want to mention is we're not only learning about the ways of organizing learning among the um, indigenous heritage kids in the studies that we've been doing, but about the, the way that middle class European heritage kids do um, organize their interactions and their learning. So, and I think that we're in need of looking at middle class children culturally and spe there's most studies have been with middle class kids but it hasn't been looked at culturally and I think we need to be turning an eye I think somebody referred to it as turning this telescope around and looking at it placing it in cultural context more, more effectively um, in many of our studies it's not just European American middle class kids who behave in the way I just described but middle class Mexican kids middle class kids in Guatemala and so on so by middle class, what I'm referring to is lots of Western schooling. I, I think that's uh, a big part of the story here. Um, this is a case graph, and it gives you the same information I just gave you, but it was a tool 
on the way to getting to that simplified graph that I just showed you. Um, I think it's a tool, the reason why I'm showing it to you is because I think it's an important way that we can bring ethnographic case-based fidelity to quantitative analyses. So we've, we've got, we can turn back to the individual cases and say, okay, this, the, on the, among the European American middle class kids, there's a few kids that look pretty much like they could fit into the graph on the left. What's going on there? And so we could go back and explore, okay, there's some, uh, there's some differences there that actually make sense. Some of those kids are homeschooled. What that, how that happens, I don't know, but there's some things we can discover by keeping our focus on cases and making sure that when we give averages, that the averages are, are somehow representing what's real in the cases and not just sort of artificial averages. And I think case graphs are a really important way to move between uh, ethnographic understanding of, of individual cases to trying to make some statements that go across a group of people. Um, I'm just looking at the time. Um, we often contrast the middle class, the highly schooled families' way of doing things with the um, w with the way that we see more commonly among indigenous heritage kids in in the Americas. Um, and they seem often to be doing things in a way that fits with a way of organizing schooling, which we refer to as assembly line instruction. But I want to mention that there are schools that are organized in ways other than assembly line instruction. And I think that's very important for um, not just thinking that school as a as sort of a monolithic institution is the way, is what we're stuck with. There's a lot of experiments in trying to get schooling away from assembly line instruction. Um, one of them I've had the opportunity to do research in and we wrote a collaborative book about a, a kindergarten through sixth grade public elementary school in Utah where the, the model of, of teaching and learning is very much like LOPI with children and adults collaborating together in um, endeavors that are important to the children as well as the adults and with purpose. So I just wanna mention, um, I think there's some work to be done there as well. And these are not the only two ways that I think we could be examining um, sort of cultural organization of ways of learning. They're, I'm not placing them as a dichotomy or in opposition, but the contrasts are very informative. I think we could be looking at other ways. Um, and especially I'm curious about ways other than in middle class communities and indigenous heritage communities of the Americas. What about the rest of the world? There may be places that do things like LOPI. There may be places that we could have a different articulated prism that describes local understandings of how to, uh, how to organize teaching and learning. And that, I think, would be really valuable. Um, the third feature that I, th that I think helps us in the consortium to have a, a good, good uh, collaboration is that we have a format that supports it. Um, we have invented this way of organizing ourselves that involves, um, we've got this shared endeavor and we've got the respect for what each other has to bring to the conversation. And then we have a poster symposium which involves first a little bit of an overview from each of the people who are presenting a poster. And then the group divides into viewing about six or eight related posters with small group discussions around the posters and with the invitation to be thinking of larger questions that we would address in, in a general discussion. And um, so in the smaller group discussions, it's in whatever language people are comfortable in, everybody gets very energized by looking at the different posters. 
And when we return to the general discussion, we get really good discussion. And it's not just about little details of sample size or whatever else that people usually ask about <laughs> at national meetings and discussion sessions. It's, it's, it's deep and, and stimulating. And so for example, at the meeting that we just had in Canada, we had uh, four sessions, one on, on collaboration, one on attention, one on inclusion and contribution of children, and one on efforts uh, to understand LOPI as it occurs in non-family community kinds of situations like online gaming and um, schools in Mexico where the school people are trying to use LOPI in a school setting. So each one of those becomes a discussion, and then there's uh, overall discussion. I think that format, which you can see some images of, I think that format brings, makes it possible for people who otherwise might not express themselves to feel comfortable speaking in the small group and then comfortable speaking in the larger group. Um, it, it makes for, for some reason it's been working. We've been doing this for uh, 15 years now, I think, in, in large groups and small groups at national meetings and in our own workshops. And so a format that doesn't just replicate assembly line instruction seems to be one that helps us have that kind of discussion across all of the differences that are helping us learn. And that one has to do with facet number six of the prism, which is how do, um, how do people coordinate? Um, what, what form of communication? And it's based on, um, it builds on the engaged, engagement in the ongoing context. Um, in shared endeavors, as people employ nonverbal conversation as well as verbal conversation, as well as the ongoing activity as a way of making sense with each other of, to make progress on the, on the ongoing endeavor. Um, I'm close to out of time, um, and I think what I should do is just really briefly mention a couple of the other related um, topics related to the prism in our consortium and in, in the research phenomenon that we're trying to study. Facet 4 has to do with um, how do you conceive of learning? And there's a paradigm shift between the conception of learning in LOPI and the conception of learning in assembly line instruction with um, the LOPI version having to do with uh, people's participation in ongoing activity and in the process they grow and transform um, compared to what we see in assembly line instruction where the process of learning is regarded as transmission of knowledge from outside to inside or um, acquisition of knowledge from inside to outside with a barrier between the world and the individual. In LOPI, there's not a barrier between the world and the individual. Um, and in our consortium meetings, there, uh, there's, uh, there's of course differences between us, but I think that our ways of doing organizing things help us communicate with each other across our differences. Um, I'm gonna, um, I think just mention paying attention is a big part of what's going on and contributing, facet number five. And we've done a fair bit of research on facet five. In fact, we've done research on, on almost all of the facets. And the research involves usually um, either ethnographic studies of community ways of organizing learning throughout indigenous communities of the Americas or comparative research that looks at a particular situation and um, examines whether the way that kids respond, and it's been with kids for the most part, um, way, the way the kids respond to a situation, whether it fits with LOPI, and whether, that, whether it, that is as one would predict, knowing the cultural communities of the children and their families. So um, I, I can show you, um, I think this is worth the minute that it will take. Um, facet number five has to do with how do people learn. A large part of learning in LOPI is by preparing to or actually contributing with close attention to what's going on. And this is, um, the top image is in San Pedro, the, the 
research assistant is showing the little girl how to make a toy, how to construct a toy. It's a mouse that runs with an elastic band. And the little brother has been um, told that in a minute he'll have a chance to make an origami jumping frog, and he's been shown the frog. And so he can wait a little bit, and he'll be able to make his, the object. And he's been given a, a, a toy to play with in the meantime while he waits. It's a very interesting toy for a minute, and then it's very boring. And we're interested in seeing what the little boy pays attention to, because we think that in uh, in, situ in communities where lopi is commonly practiced, kids are very good at paying attention to stuff that's not directed at them because they are active in, their, in the learning and there's things around them that are worth paying attention to. So watch the little boy. The sound is not working. It's my fault, probably. So she's explaining. You'd almost think it was a still photograph if you just look at the little boy. He's, he's really keenly observing, even though he's not going to be making that toy, or he has no expectation. We've given him no reason to expect to make that toy. Um, OK, and then uh, the sound is a problem for this one, but we'll s let me just try it. unplugging and plugging. OK, it's all right. Um, he says, it's going to explode. In a minute, he's going to do that. OK, there he did. So he's, he's playing rocket with that little toy. And he did look over at what the other two people were doing. But it didn't seem to be that he was trying to learn what they were doing. But he was wondering why they weren't paying attention to him. So we found twice as much sustained attention among the Mayan kids in that study, Mayan kids from families with less than six years of schooling, and European heritage middle class kids whose families had a lot of schooling, half as much as those, those Mayan kids, and Mayan kids whose families had a lot of schooling, halfway in between. So um, that's a pattern that we've been seeing across Mexican immigrant populations in various parts of California as well. So that's an example of the way that we're using comparative research to try to uh, examine whether the predictions we would make based on LOPI hold up and how do they shift when we move to um, across populations that have more or less connection with indigenous, indigenous communities of the Americas. Like in the case of uh, the study here, the Mayan kids whose families have follow more traditional practices and Mayan kids whose families follow more, are more influenced by practices stemming from the United States and Europe. Or with Mexican immigrant families in California, families that have a closer involvement uh, in, in family practice with uh, indigenous communities of Mexico or have become involved more with middle class practices largely, largely involving lots of, of Western schooling. Um, so just to conclude, um, we're seeing that also, or, or we're very interested in, in understanding how cultural practices change. And part of that is in our consortium, how are we able to change our understanding, improve our understanding of this way of learning across our efforts? It's a, it's a continuing effort to try to develop that prism. Um, in fact, what I showed you was a draft prism that is sort of under underway. Because um, the last version, 2014, I feel like it's now really time from what I, I and the group have learned to make a new one. And then in 2020, hopefully, there will be a whole other one. It's a process of change that makes use of individuals and communities coming together to try to understand um, things better, engaging together, contributing together. And that's also what happens in the Mayan community, not necessarily improvement. But um, the book that uh, I wrote together with um, uh, um, 
Mayan expert on child rearing, a, a, a midwife, um, and her two grandkids, focuses on cultural change across her lifetime, which was 90 years, um, and as well as going back several centuries before that where I could find documentation, um, looking at cultural changes and continuities in children's lives, family lives, in, in this Mayan town where um, taking advantage of the historical window that we get from getting older and the field notes that I had access to from being an inheritor of Ben and Lois Paul's field notes. And um, so I, I just want to say, I think we're learning things about what practices there are and what practices have some resilience over time and which ones melt away in the face of practices or or other forces from other communities, including things like uh, colonization, globalization, and um, actually one that has come up in some discussions you know, that I've been involved in here is efforts like intervention efforts in the US, Mexico, perhaps all over the world uh, that, that involves the sort of ethnocentric idea about a word gap, as if language is contained by how many words you know, and those poor people don't have enough words, so if we only gave them some more words, they wouldn't be poor anymore. Um, and so thinking about um, culture change and, and how, how does, never has there been a community that was pristine. Um, how do we understand culture changes? I think part of the endeavor that we're that we're involved in, and three ways that I think I can offer based on my experience with our consortium is focus on a shared endeavor, learn from each other with respect and um, and a shared initiative, and use communication forms that support shared engagement. And uh, with that, I uh, thank you for. Being here at the end of the day, but I hope some of you have comments or, or um, I think we have a little bit of time for comments and questions um, before we go into the general discussion. Um, and I hope you aren't too worn out for that. Thank you. <laughs>